Appearing delicate and often seemingly fragile, nests are resilient enough to withstand many elements of the weather. There's something about them that invites curiosity. If we find them unused, we see them as treasures fallen from above. You'd be forgiven for thinking that the beautiful work of Zora Verona was a gift of nature. In fact, her intricate weavings are nature's replicas, re-envisioning nests that are held in natural history collections worldwide, giving us a rare glimpse into some of the oldest nests on record. From early recollections as a child growing up in Canada, artist Laurie Crevoss, creating under the name Zora Verona, had fond and warm memories of the feather duvets that covered the beds at the home of her Slovakian grandparents. From climbing the wooden stairs up to the attic bedroom, the temperature dropping, her breath puffing out like dragons, perhaps this is where her fascination with nests began. Flying forward to 2020, Zora Verona was determined to create a sustainable art practice and is considered an emerging artist. Describing her needle as her beak, she celebrates the beauty of natural fibres inspired by the bird as artist and architect. Diving into the history of past creations, Zora Verona weaves her works saying, every bird and their nest has a fascinating backstory that reminds us just how precious our natural world is and how potentially precarious. I create to tell stories, to hopefully ignite a passion for the birds and ultimately their protection by you, the viewer. With a deep love for nature and history, her first solo exhibition, The Art and Crafts of Nests, poses the question, could birds have inspired our art and craft traditions? So let's find out more about this invitation to awaken an understanding that every bird species is worthy of our wonder and awe, as we welcome our 77th Friday feature artist, Zora Verona. Hello, Zora. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Anne. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited to share your work and your love and your passion for birds' nests and weaving with uh, with the world. This is so <laughs> Yeah, exciting. But whilst everyone's popping their comments in to say hello and let us know where they are in the world, can you? I don't want to confuse people. So your name, <laughs> your name's actually Laurie, and I'll probably refer to you as Laurie. Tell us, where did Zora Verona come from? Yeah, so Zora and Verona are my two grandmothers. Uh, Zora on my father's side, Verona on my mum's side. And when I thought about a name in which I was going to create under, I couldn't think of a better name than to honour these two women uh, who had very complicated lives. You know, they lived through difficult times and I thought how beautiful to be able to honour them. Uh, Zora also means the light at dawn. Uh, Verona means uh, truth. And I thought, what greater truth telling is there than the sound of bird song at the light of dawn? So it, it had a lot of synergies for me. But yes, my, my friends and family know me as Laurie. <laughs> so you're welcome to call me whichever one you prefer. <laughs> That's so beautiful. Thank you so much. And I love that story, the light. What was it? The light at dawn. The light at dawn. So, yeah, Zora is a, a Slovenian word mm -hmm. and it means the light at dawn. Um, and it's also the name of my aunt uh, who lives in Slovenia still. So, um, yeah, there's that synergy. And Verona is actually my grandmother and my great-grandmother's name um, too. So pretty special, both of those wow. names. Wow. Wow. Because you do have a very multicultural background, don't you? Tell us just briefly yeah. where you come from, where you grew up. Like, <laughs> how did you end up in Australia? Yeah, so um, my father was born in Slovenia um, and came out to Canada after World War II. Um, my mum's uh, uh, parents um, were born in Slovakia, and so they as well. So my grandmother actually was born in Canada, but her mother um, uh, was born in Slovakia and they came out to Canada in about the 1800s. Um, and so my mum and dad met in Canada. I was born in Canada, um, but I've sort of lived uh, all over the place. Um, Calgary, Vancouver, Montreal was my last home in Canada, um, the UK. Um, but I came here on a working holiday visa and I fell in love with Australia. It's just such a beautiful, beautiful place. So, 
Yeah, and I'm very um, happy to call the Yarra Valley my home. So I lived in Melbourne, Sydney, Port Douglas, but yeah, I absolutely love the Yarra Valley. So that's why I'm calling in here today. So. Oh, that's gorgeous. And I do, I know I have an image in here somewhere because we've got lots of images to share tonight, yeah. which is exciting. Actually, maybe it's not in here now. Um, there was a beautiful photo. Oh, here we go. Here it is. You're gorgeous. Um, uh, yes, so that's, um, uh, I'm sitting behind those windows, um, so looking out to that beautiful field of yeah. lilies. That's, um, that's my home and studio. What a place to be. So that is gorgeous. Thank you for sharing that. That is so great. We're not alone tonight. We have got so many people from all over the world uh, tuning in. We've got the gorgeous Eva from Sweden. Hi, Eva. Hello, Eva. Um, Fiona from Lancashire. Hello from Melbourne. I hope you're staying dry, Robin. It's been so wet here, hasn't it? And Vicky, g'day, Vic. And Andrea, hello. Tracy, really, look, yeah. Two random weaves have been nest. That's fantastic. Yeah, I think you're going to love this. Um, kia ora, Francie. Nice to see you. Oh, from France. Hello. Bonjour. <laughs> yes, beautiful. Wada Wang. Now I'm going to say it wrong. Wada Wangarang country. Beautiful. Christchurch. So hello, gorgeous Deb from Ballina. So, so many people. I'm going to flick through names really quickly because we do have a lot to get through, but I just appreciate everyone um, oh. joining. Hello. <laughs> you got some friends here? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, beautiful. So, Laurie, tell me, how, where did your love of bird's nest begin? Like, how did this love affair start? Yeah, well, I think it, um, I've always been connected to the natural world, but I think it really began uh, when I moved here to Warburton. And uh, I still remember that first windstorms. Windstorms are in the country are nothing like they are in the city because, you know, the house shakes and the trees are just bending. Um, but I went out to check the fences in the paddock the next morning and there was this tumbleweed, this beautiful glimmering tumbleweed going through the paddocks. And I, I ran after it and caught it in my hands and um, it was a bird's nest and I looked down at it and it was the most exquisite thing I'd ever seen. Um, and I've been very lucky over uh, a period of time to um, come across these wonders. And so that um, sort of lodged itself in my mind. Um, and uh, fast forward to 2020, um, I was... Um, Really, uh, some deep anxieties came back. So I was up here in the Yarra Valley in 2009 during the Black Saturday bushfires. Um, and mm -hmm. yeah, and um, I was really seeking a sense of restoration um, in 2020 and really concerned. And I thought, oh, I knew that uh, creativity was a, a, a wonderful way to, uh, to have that restoration and have that sense of flow return to you. And I always harbored a desire to have a creative practice um, so I looked around me and there was, you know, um, beautiful spinebills feeding on the salvia blooms outside my window and the lyrebirds were singing in the distance and all these fairy wrens were jumping on the lawn and um, it just, it clicked. I thought I could use natural fibres to create bird's nest sculptures. So, wow. yeah, that's how it started. And then it sort of just snowballed <laughs> from there. Did you always want to have a creative practice? Like I know you have an amazing career at, at, at Melbourne Zoo, but um, was it? what is it about having a creative practice has always been part of your being, do you think? Uh, it was something I can't quite remember the moment, but when I lived in Montreal, um, that was where I really sort of embraced it. So I did um, paper making with natural fibres, um, I did calligraphy, I did a bit of work with clay, and I was thinking about pursuing a career um, as a as a potter and was going to sign up for a course but there is a lot of uh, stigma about um, art being a hobby and not a career and mm -hmm. so I sort of packed away my materials and that's when I went traveling and came here to Australia and so it wasn't until 2020 where I thought you know this is a very important part of your life to um, explore those kind of things but it was also the message you know there was so many animals there was billions of animals that were displaced or lost their lives during those bushfires and I also knew from um, I'd worked for um, the Royal Botanic Gardens for a period of time and they have the most amazing natural history collections 
and they're so significant and important. And besides our floral collections, we also have fauna. So there's birds' nests around the world in natural history collections. And the stories are not told. And so I wanted to tell the stories um, mm -hmm. that, in a way that most people uh, didn't experience. And, and when you live in the city, you don't necessarily see birds' nests. You don't have that privilege. Um, and so that was something else I wanted to bring to people was that sense of wonder. Um, yeah. I think, you know, with the with the trauma of, you know, the 2020 and the last couple of years, there have mm -hmm. been some beautiful things come out of it. And I think people really had that chance to sort of take stock of what was important to them in life and go, okay, maybe I do have a little bit more time now to actually mm -hmm. pursue these longings. So good on you. I think that's um, amazing. And, you, you know, you call yourself an emerging artist, but you're certainly up there, I tell you now. Like, yeah, it works yeah. just beautiful um Laurie can you tell us a little bit about where you um learnt your basketry techniques was it, yeah. was it, was it how, how did that road look for you <laughs> oh, it's quite funny I started with a book by Janine Burke which I think is called the art of birds if you're on my website I have an inspiration page and that's there that was my first book and it had a few pictures of birds nests in it and, of course, I had bird's nests that I observed in my own garden. So that's where I started. And, um, you know, I did pretty well. I couldn't believe how, how they had come together. But something I've learned about all the nests I've made since is you just have to keep going. They often look really wonky. <laughs> and just like a bird, you have to stay determined and just keep adding to them. Um, but from there, uh, I've got another beautiful book from Sharon Beale. She does the most stunning photography of natural history collection nests. Um, but there were still a lot of structures and shapes that, uh, like especially those dome shapes I was really struggling with. And I hit upon a great um, online resource um, called Craft School Oz with Ruth Woods. And that's where I first learned uh, how to make some of the shapes and have that structural integrity that I needed. Um, and it's great. I've also signed up for um, Harriet Goodall's course. So I'm really looking forward. Uh, Ruth's was such an amazing introduction. I think it's called Baskets from the Garden and it's using all natural materials. And that's what birds nests are, they're baskets. But I'm really excited to, um, to get further into Harriet's course and, and keep growing my learning. So, yeah, there's still yeah. a few shapes that, you know, <laughs> the birds do it better. And so I've, I've got some learning to do. There's just some amazing online resources out there now. And we're certainly huge fans of the Craft School Oz and Ruth. So if you're watching Ruth, hello. Um, Ruth has, we're going to get to this, but Ruth has just published her first book, which is really exciting. Um, so we're, well, you know, should we talk about it now? Let's talk about oh, it. Let's <laughs> yeah, do it. Let's do it. <laughs> so tell us, you were invited by Ruth to be one of the 14 artists to uh, contribute to this uh, amazing weaving book. Tell us about it. And this is why I'm like emerging artist. You're already published. We just had a dollar. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> well, I think the thing that really captured Ruth's imagination, and she can correct me, so apologies, Ruth, if I get the story wrong, but um, that I had taken uh, the knowledge and put it in a completely different direction. So with yes. the title of the book, you know, it's very much finding form with fibre. So I think teachers love it when people um, utilise the skills, but then they take it in a completely different direction. And so when she was considering, she had one last spot left, she reached out to me. And it was funny because I thought she was already finished the book. And I remember walking along the rail trail thinking, oh, I would love to have been in Ruth's book. I wish I could have been in Ruth's book, but it's finished now. And then oh. she reached out to me the very next day and said, you wouldn't be in my book, would you? <laughs> I'm like, would oh, I? Yeah, it was a great, um, great synergy. And I was very honoured. There's some amazing artists in the book. Um, I'm very excited to have my copy too. And it's just beautiful. It's got all sorts of um, skills and techniques. But the stories of the artists, I think, is the real gem. And there's there's 14 uh, different artists with completely different stories. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's divine. I've just put a link up um, for everyone to, to check out the Craft School Oz website and about the book. So Ruth tells me that it is available now in Australia and at a very reasonable price too. So jump on there and check it out. And then it should be coming out on Amazon for international customers um, very shortly. So so keep an eye out. But I certainly was, was loving it. And it's interesting the name, like you were saying, you know, mm -hmm. finding 
form with fiber and Harriet's course was called you know um form to freedom so that was oh, yeah. Was, yeah so it's interesting that that word form it is like once you learn how to make the shape you know Harriet preaches like once you've learned those basic techniques you really do have freedom in your weaving and you can take it anywhere so um yeah was, I found it revolutionary as well too like in growing in my practice when I took that first course I recognized then which I don't think I quite recognized at the start is how all the techniques that we humans lay claim to mm. that's what birds are doing so they're stripping the fibers they're coiling fibers uh, they're felting fibers, random weave. Like I've uh, attempted to do a, an African bird. We'll see it later at the city library. But they're random weave. If you actually see the real nest, like you know, all apologies to Ruth and Harriet, but boy, that bird. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, we, you know, it's really hard to hold a candle to some of these birds and the techniques that they. Oh, so, so we claim that they're ours, but I'm not so sure. <laughs> oh, absolutely, <laughs> not. inspired by nature. And we we were so lucky to be invited to come to the city library through oh. through Laurie and the city of Melbourne to to actually film uh, on Wednesday night. We we had a little private tour with Laurie <laughs> and we filmed it for everybody. And we're so pleased to be able to share that with people tonight. So we just felt that it just we had to be there. I mean, the images are gorgeous, but we just had to be there. It was a bit selfish of me, really. I just wanted to see them and touch them. No, it was great fun. I'm really glad you could come. And, and I, I do hope, um, you know, if people live in Melbourne, uh, the City Library is just on Flinders um, Lane into Grave Street. Um, mm -hmm. And it's beautiful. There's 27 nest sculptures and they're in something called the City Library niches. So they're, they're sort of hidden all over the library. So it's quite fun to actually go in and see if you can find all 27 across yeah, the store. It is. It's like a little treasure trove. Before, yeah. we, show, before we show the video, um, Laurie, can you tell us a little bit about, um, I mean, the, the video tells tell us, but tell us about the exhibition. Mm -hmm. Like, and then we'll, we'll, what we'll do is the video is cut into two sections. So what we thought is we'll play the first 10 minutes of the video and then people who are watching, please ask questions. You know, this is why we do things live. Pop your comments in, ask questions to um, Laurie. And then we'll play the second half of the video, which takes us more in depth. But it really will give everybody a, a sort of a close-up view of these gorgeous birds' nests that you do. But mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about uh, how it came to be. Yeah, so it was um, sort of two things, Bird Week, National Bird Week's coming up and uh, my work is all about raising awareness um, for our bird species and I truly believe that if we uh, recognise something, if we get to know about it and we're inspired by it, we'll care about it. So that was sort of uh, the impetus behind my work but also the exhibition and it was that sense of discovery that... Um, Birds are artists and they're craftsmen and they're architects and I wanted people to, to gain that understanding. So I researched natural history collections, uh, six different natural history museums around the world and found uh, historic examples that displayed or demonstrated all these different techniques, weaving, stitch, felt, plus the precursors to our own textile. So it's called the art and craft of Ness. And um, yeah, it's it's um, very much that narrative um, of how humans and birds have evolved together, and perhaps our arts and craft practices have been inspired by one another. Wonderful. Well, I'm going to jump to the first half of the video, and for everyone watching, I hope you enjoy it. Pop your comments in um, just through the comments section. If you've got a question, we'll pop, we'll break in about 10 minutes and then we'll come back to questions. But this is a pre-recorded video, as you'll see. So I just didn't want to confuse anyone that, with that. Um, so let's go, the art and craft of Ness. Can't wait to see this. Hello, uh, my name is Dora Verona and welcome to the City Library. Um, we're here today, tonight, for um, the Art and Craft of Ness, which is my first solo exhibition. It's part of Craft Contemporary, a month-long festival um, here in Victoria for Craft Victoria, um, celebrating all things craft. Um, it's also part of National Bird Week, uh, which runs from the 17th to the 23rd of October. And, and I'd love to show you some of my sculptures. So there's 27 nest sculptures here, which have all been inspired by the art and craft of birds. So here we are. This is the first set of six of the 27 nest sculptures here at the City Library. 
and these are demonstrating all the techniques that birds use um, within their nest building, which are all echoed in our human weaving, felting and stitching traditions. So I've done two nests that represent different types of weaving, uh, felt and stitch. So these first two are woven nests um, and I've chosen one Australian bird and one um, exotic bird from Africa. And this one's a perfect example of coiling, what we call a coiled stitch. So this is an Australian uh, reed warbler. And so this nest out in the wild, you would find it, they actually build it on the reeds and it would just sway in the wind like that. But essentially what they've done is, is our own techniques of what we call coiling and stitching for that one. And then this other one, this is from Africa. And this incredible nest is what we would lay claim to as random weave. Um, and this beautiful nest in the wild would hang on a palm branch like that. And the reason they build it in this way is because of the uh, loose formation. Snakes can't actually climb um, that uh, random weave structure. And the bird, when they fly into it, it's quite extraordinary. They'll tuck its wings in really tight and they'll shoot up the tunnel. And then when they get to top, they'll climb into that last bit. And so that's where you'd find the little chicks up there. But um, the weaver birds have been found um, in archaeological digs along with Homo habilis, so a species of human that long predates humans, uh, Homo sapiens. So therefore, I think we might have learned to do the random weave from birds. <laughs> and these are the second series of nest and this one is felt and all the felters in the audience would recognize that there's sort of two types of felt there's needle felting but then there's a the more traditional overlaying of fibers um, and friction caused by friction so and again i've represented an australian bird and a bird from overseas so this one's our white nape honey eater and you can see with this lovely little specimen here the, bo the body of the bird has just turned over and over again within the nest. So it's the friction of its breast turning over and over again. It's, it's very heartbeat is, is within that nest. And something I should mention is um, all of the nests here today are all inspired by natural history collections. So these are actual specimens that exist in natural history collections. And I've used those as my research to recreate them as nest sculptures. Um, and this nest is very extraordinary. It's like a felted pouch um, and it's a bird called the Cape T Pendeline Tit Nest. Um, and this is a perfect example of needle felting. So the bird takes its beak and, and rapid fire felts um, until it creates this beautiful pouch. It creates two openings. And normally, I've left this one open so you can see it, but normally in the wild that one would be closed. And it creates this false chamber at the front so that um, if a snake comes along and decides it's going to have a little lunch, it will go into the false chamber at the front of the nest and it'll be disappointed. There'll be no nestlings there. But the bird will come along and this pouch will be closed. He'll just flip that opening and he'll go down behind the false chamber and his beautiful little nestlings will be safe or his eggs will be in the back there. But like I said, extraordinary to watch them. Um, it's needle felting to a T. So for the needle felters out there, you'll certainly recognize um, all the work that you do. Um, this little beautiful Cape Penderline tip has done as well to create its, its nest. That one back. And these are two examples of birds that stitch. Um, we've got uh, the Taylor bird and another one called uh, the Sister Cola. And amazingly enough, it's both the females and the species that make the nest. So I'm not really sure why they're called tailor birds. I think they should be called seamstress birds. But this one's a dissection uh, to show you what it would look like on the inside. So out in the wild, this would actually have another leaf covering over top and it would all be stitched down the outside. Beautiful. And this one here, you can really sort of see, um, I've tried to recreate what it would be like. So the female bird would actually, with her feet, she would clasp the leaves around herself. And she would almost like a dress. She would pull the leaves around her to test it for fit. And just like our own sewing projects, if the fabric isn't large enough, we would grab another piece and we would add it to it and we would stitch it. And the real nest isn't this outside leaf, it of course is what's been created inside. And she'll often create another little canopy layer with a leaf over top. Um, 
and anyone who watches it, it's quite amazing to see. They really are stitching the leaves together, just like we humans would do. And now I'd love to take you to another part of the library. Um, I've got a few different sections. The next section is called With What Is Left and there's four beautiful nests to discover. Lovely. So this is the next four nests in my series of 27 and it's a series called With What Is Left. Our habitats are shrinking continually and birds are, um, have to rely on what we leave behind in the environment. But it does come at a cost, so even though the ingenuity with the materials that they've used is quite extraordinary, um, it, it does cause a lot of um, concern uh, for people who care for birds because there is entanglement, so they can strangle themselves. These uh, fibres from fishing line to binding cords on hay bale twines, they don't break like a natural fibre would. And there's also a lack of insulation, uh, which natural materials would provide over in the wild. So all four are a particular bird called the oriole, but they're all different species of, of orioles, um, but quite extraordinary. Uh, orioles are in North America, um, so for our North American listeners, you'll probably recognise them. But it is also an issue here in Australia, so our own Australian birds are also using um, a lot of human waste in their nests. Well, this one I thought was quite extraordinary. It's using a very long pine needle. And a lot of people who do weaving, this would uh, be something that we would all covet to find such long pine needles to do our weaving with. Um, and it's quite a sad story. The pine needles, are, the long pine uh, is disappearing from many habitats in North America. It's got a long history uh, with the Native American Indians and their weaving traditions. So I thought it quite signified, you know, that the bird as well is losing their habitat and the Native American people are losing a cultural practice um, with which they would weave. But it's quite extraordinary that the bird would weave in and out between each of these nests, uh, each of these needles rather, to bring them all together to um, create a nesting cavity for its young. And these nests have all come from, uh, well, three of them have come from the Western Foundation of Vertebrate Zoology, or I should say the inspiration for the nests have come from their specimen collection. So they have one of the richest um, natural history collections in the world. So fishing line is a, is a real problem for a lot of uh, wildlife. So whether that be birds, seals, um, uh, all aquatic birds, they really do risk entanglement and, and it can cut um, very simply. But this nest was actually found uh, in the Bow River in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And I thought there was some really beautiful synergy because that is my hometown. Um, so when I reached out to the researcher, um, there was a beautiful um, article about this fishing line nest in Audubon magazine. Um, and I, she said, oh, it had been found in my hometown. So it, uh, she's a, an Oriole specialist, um, but she very kindly sent me pictures from which to work from. And the fishing line itself has been sourced from something called the seal the loop bins. Um, so you might have noticed along your waterways or along the ocean, there is an opportunity to actually discard of your um, fishing line responsibly. So I thought it told a beautiful story, not only of the bird's skill and ingenuity, um, but also that we can make a difference. Um, we can choose to um, change our actions just slightly and we can um, do great things for our birds. So that was a little opening at the back so the bird would actually go in there. But you can imagine in weaving something like this how easily the bird could become tangled um, and so how they manage to weave it together is, is really quite extraordinary. Wow, is it raining where you are? Uh, no, not at the moment, but we've had a lot of rain. <laughs> oh, I could just hear some static noise. I thought maybe it was pouring down. I think I have my microphone up too high. Is that better? <laughs> <laughs> that was great, that first half. That was really good. Um, and, and you know what I love about that video is that it's just like we were literally in the library and people are walking around and they're sitting there <laughs> and they're returning their books. And I just thought it was so great. <laughs> uh, and it is wonderful. It's such a gorgeous public space. 
And for me as an artist, that was much more important than uh, a traditional gallery space. I really wanted people to engage with the work. And I think it's very important for people to engage with art as part of their everyday life. Um, so, yeah, they are coming and they're returning their books and suddenly they're like, what is this amazing felted pouch? And then there's an opportunity to read about the story and um, them being masters of felting but also masters of deception as well to create that false chamber at the front. Oh, yeah, amazing. Um, Vicky says that the name of your uh, exhibition sounds like a gorgeous <laughs> title of a book. I, I totally agree. <laughs> space, exactly. And the platypus get tangled in fishing line too. So true. So yeah. true. It's yeah. really dangerous. Um, like even when I was working with it, because um, I had to untangle it, it came out of the seal the loop bins. And um, it was, yeah, it was extraordinary so um and people often don't they dispose of it in these bins that are provided they actually you know leave it on the shoreline and birds do use it for their nests or they sometimes feed it to their chicks with the hook still attached so yeah it's a really important message um, oh, absolutely i'm enthralled so i want to keep going with part two if everyone's okay with that and then we'll circle back and i might ask you some questions about the materials that you use and some of your favorite little secret techniques for your eggs <laughs> Sounds great. Sounds great. Okay. Let's keep going, people. Well, this one's really quite extraordinary. Uh, it's a Northern Oriole, um, which has now been uh, renamed. It's the Bullock's Oriole. But um, uh, it was a, based on a historic specimen from the Western Foundation of Vertebrate Zoology. And this particular bird was on a, a disused farm, but there was a dilapidated barn that was just filled with binding cords. So some people who have horses or livestock would recognize that is something that often gets left in our paddocks and barns. And so the bird has taken it and it's split the individual fibers to weave them all together to create this beautiful little pouch for its nestling young. Um, and this particular nest was chosen as a finalist in the um, environmental awards in the Northern Beaches Council. Um, so I was one, it was great for it to travel to Sydney and now it's here in Melbourne um, to tell the story of, you know, why we, we, we must leave habitat and not our human waste behind for birds. It was quite funny, the um, women from Basket Makers Victoria, we were talking about this particular nest when I was made here, and they said it's actually got a name, it's called cobble stitch. So when you, um, you know, are quite random in your stitching process, um, they refer to it as a cobble, cobble stitch. And I think he's done an excellent example of the cobble stitch, our, our friend. Um, and I've done my best to copy his handiwork. And I'd love to welcome you to this next section. And this is talking about all the materials. So these are sort of the precursors to our modern day textiles. And birds have shown great examples of things that we always used to use uh, culturally over centuries. So bark, uh, feather, fur, wool, all of these things in our own tradition um, that we have used, birds have used also. This is a beautiful, this is a region honey eater. And some people might have listened to Tracy Deep's uh, segment last week. Um, the region honey eater is losing its song. There's so few birds left in the wild that they no longer have uh, parents to teach them their songs. And the songs are really important um, for them to find a mate. These are their love songs that they're losing. But um, part of the reason why they're disappearing is the bark. So the bark and the bird go hand in hand. If they don't have bark, which means they don't have habitats and forests, then they will um, disappear. So this one is based on a specimen from Museum Victoria, um, collected probably around the 1970s. They don't have um, data, but it was already in trouble then. And there's two examples of nests that have been made with feathers, um, and feathers are wonderful insulation. So anyone who's got a feather duvet at home, you'll recognize how insulating this material is. So this is a bird called the striped honey eater and um, they've been known to make their nest with grass and a few emu feathers. But this particular specimen held by the Museum Victoria that inspired my sculpture, as you can see, I can't even see a blade of grass and, and that's how the original was. It was just festooned um, with emu feathers. So for me, I just thought he must have been a master milner. You know, this nest would be just as comfortable on someone's head as a hat. Um, as it would as a nest up in the trees. That's, and this was one of uh, my favorite specimens that I came across that inspired this sculpture. It's something called a brambling and it lives in Russia and Scandinavia in really cold climates. And it thinks that England and Scotland are really wonderful places to spend the winter. So most people in England and 
um, Scotland would probably go to Spain <laughs> for winter, but this wonderful bird thinks that it's perfect. Um, so it doesn't normally nest there, but the specimen that inspired this sculpture from 1928 in Scotland, so the bird obviously must have decided to, to stay in its um, winter ground and nest. But it's beautiful, it's all um, very cushioned, um, all done with moss, uh, feather and horsehair. So it's all stitched with horsehair and lined with horsehair as well. And there's a beautiful long-standing tradition in Chinese culture to stitch with horsehair. And one of the things that they stitch is a carrier for their babies. Um, and they feel that it'll bring good luck to their children. And so I like to think of this bird using horsehair as well um, for its children and the fact that it will bring them good luck. Right, and so this next one I'd love to show you has been made with snake skin. And this is uh, common for both uh, the bird species that this um, was inspired. So it's a Victorian rifle bird or a magnificent rifle bird. So they're a bird that lives up in Queensland, but even in North America, um, birds as well will use snake skin in their nests. And a lot of university studies have been done to show that predation, um, it actually stops predation of nests. But um, I think, you know, it's a fabulous fashion accessory as well. <laughs> so I know we, um, you know, throughout the ages have used uh, snake skin in doing our arts and craft. Um, but the bird uses it for a very specific purpose, and that's to protect its nestlings. So, yeah, and that's um, the specimen that inspired this sculpture is actually from the Natural History Museum in London in Tree. Um, and it was collected in Australia, um, I think it was around the 1920s, early 1900s. Um, so you can imagine that that original nest specimen hardly ever sees the light of day. Um, so I thought it was quite wonderful to be able to bring it um, to an audience here in Australia to view. Gorgeous. And this next series that I wanted to show you are examples of, of birds that have used wool in their nests. Um, so this looks like probably a lot of people's knitting bags at home, lots of leftover yarn. Um, but I, I did it as a bit of a textile time capsule. I, I read of this beautiful story where um, buffalo fibre had been found within a western kingbird's nest. Um, and then as I looked at different specimens throughout the ages, buffalo fibre didn't exist anymore in the nest. It, it had changed to sheep wool to more to human uh, man-made um, materials. And, you know, it, you could easily see how the buffalo had been lost on the plains of North America. And, of course, the bird no longer could source buffalo fibre and so one of my favourite things about um, this process that I didn't expect was to form these relationships with the curators at the National History Museums around the world. And I was sent this picture of this beautiful nest, which inspired this sculpture by a man named René Corrado. And he was a shoeshine boy in Guatemala. And he came to the US and he uh, became an ornithologist. And he now manages the Western Foundation of Vertebrate. Uh, zoology with a bird museum and research centre. It's a mouthful, um, along with his colleagues, of course. But this particular nest uh, was from the Galapagos, or the one that inspired my sculpture, rather, um, from 1906. And they have a particular type of cotton um, called cotton darwinii uh, on the Galapagos Islands. And you can see the bird pulls the cotton from the plant and then felts it into its nest. And it creates this wonderful little vase shape um, with a bowl at the top. And if you're coming to the library, be sure to come upstairs. There's another three sculptures waiting for you to discover. And this particular one here is called um, Contemporary Art. And you can see he's sort of the enfant terrible, uh, or the infant terrible of the art world. This is a magpie-inspired nest. So the original uh, lives at the Australian National Wildlife Collection in Canberra. And this particular bird lived near a construction site in Canberra. And so he has taken all these incredible objects from um, coat hangers, uh, earbuds, uh, champagne cork stoppers, and even a pair of 3D sunglasses and woven them into his nest. And um, I like to think, you know, they talk about infantile, like someone like Damien Hirst, you know, of the art world. They really push the boundaries and, and they're trying almost to um, raise our awareness for a particular subject matter. And so I like to think of this magpie that he is actually sort of as well saying to us about the habitat that we've left him and the waste that we're leaving behind as a, a perfect example for us to come to awareness. But it's really quite extraordinary. We should um, realise how in ingenious he is as an artist.
I want to say thank you for coming along tonight and um, for listening to the interview, but also coming on this little virtual tour um, of the City Library here in Melbourne um, to see the 27 nest sculptures. So we haven't been able to show all of them to you tonight, but I hope you'll get a chance to visit them in person. Um, there's also a full catalogue available online, so you can see images of all the nest sculptures as well as the stories um, that inspired them. I would love for the exhibition to travel. So many people ask me, are there nest sculptures for sale? Um, and they're not for sale on this occasion because I really would love for this body of work to travel throughout Australia and inspire as many people as possible to care about our wildlife. What inspired me right from the start was that idea that we don't take wildlife for granted, that we recognise how special they are, how talented they are as artisans, craftsmen, architecture, um, they really have taught us so much and so I hope in people um, connecting with the birds and connecting with their stories that we'll all learn to care a little bit more about our bird life. little birds in the background at the end. That was a nice touch my husband put on there, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, well done, Daniel. Well done. I always feel like I have a, um, a soundtrack here at home. I'm just so lucky. I've got um, about 35 species of birds and um, a bird bath right outside this window. And, um, yeah, they're always there singing along and twittering and keeping me company. And I loved it when I was making that big contemporary magpie nest. I, I went inside to get a glass of water and I came back out. And I was doing it in the garage, that one, because it was particularly um, uh, quite messy. And um, there was there was this raven sitting on top of it, stealing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yes, I think it's quite, it's quite an interactive process, the birds and I, um, here. No, and, no. Yeah, I and one of my, it was a sculpture I made for my last uh, exhibition, it was a joint exhibition with my partner, and oh, um, it was a particular bird that had made a nest in a tin can, so I was looking for like a rusted paint tin can, and I actually had two, and I sort of looked at them and I thought, well, I'll take this one. and. I couldn't believe it. A few months later, I found the other can had knocked off the plant table. It was on the ground, and sure enough, inside of it was a bird's nest. Oh. And I just thought it was so extraordinary that I had chosen one and it had taken the other, and we had both made a bird's nest in these two almost identical rusted tin cans. So, yeah, I, oh. I, feel, like I feel like they're watching me. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well, everybody is making comments saying amazing. Um, I will going uh, we are gonna circle back to Slavena's uh comments. So I'll just go through these first. Yes, sourcing materials, we're gonna get to that as well, Rachel. Um oh, we had Willy Wagtail's nest in our garden and that they had lined their nest with hair from our Labrador. Oh, that's gorgeous. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so important. Uh, and we've got oh gorgeous Harriet Goodall's here watching tonight. Oh, so hello, Harriet. <laughs> Such yeah, rich field of inquiry and inspiration. Yes, that is a wonderful comment. Actually, R very rich and deep. Laurie, amazing. Yes. So I just want to circle back to a comment because. Um, Slavana says, I'm a little confused. Are these nests ones that Zora made or examples of original bird's nests from a museum? So, mm -hmm. and I was actually going to ask you too, Laurie, like, do you actually get to go and physically see the nests or are you given photographs or how, what's your process yeah. look like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so some of the bird's nests um, I've been inspired by are ones in my own garden. Um but uh, the majority of ones I've worked from photos. So um, uh, I did work from um, some of the photos that I was very privileged. I went to CSIRO, to the Australian National Wildlife Collection. So if Tonya Huff's watching this, hi, Tonya. Um, she actually let us into the catacombs um, and she opened up um, quite a few nest boxes for us to photograph and take notes. 
And so I think there's about four sculptures that have been inspired from nests that I've seen in natural history collections. But um, it's quite hard to get access to these spaces. Um, the mm. curators that work in them are um, very dedicated and they're out in the field and they have enormous collections that they have to look after. So it's a real privilege um, to be able to go in. So often I'm just working from photos, um, but sometimes I've got questions about a particular um you know, I saw a photograph of the northern Orioles nest. That's the one with the cobble stitch. Um, and so I thought it was from the Western Foundation of Vertebrate Zoology, but I wasn't sure. So I reached out to Rene Corrado there, and he was wonderful. He actually sent me pictures of the original, so not ones that a photographer had taken. So they I sometimes will look a little different. He also supplied me with the collection notes, which told me, uh, yes, that's the one. And he supplied me with the collection notes uh, that said that it had been found on an abandoned ranch and that there was a dilapidated barn nearby and there was hay bale binding cords. So I suspected it was made of hay bale, bind hay bale binding cords, but I didn't know until I actually saw those collection notes. So it's a real mixture. And um, yes, all of those... Uh, nests that are at the city library are sculptures um, but they've been inspired by real nest specimens um, but yes they are mine and so I'm always very touched when people think that a bird made them because I think I've done it yeah. <laughs> I've, you know I've made a convincing um, artistic inspiration but like um, yeah. the one from the Galapagos Islands I want to have another go at it I feel like the bird there was something about it. It just it just tugged at your heartstrings. So that one is beautiful, but um, there's just had another layer that just tugged at your heart. And so I want to have another go at making that one and see if I can, um, you know, pay homage to the bird just to get it a bit right. But, yeah. oh, and they yeah. do the same. Birds often um, uh, have to create nest after nest. So I loved reading about... Um, some of the uh, weaver birds, um, that they might have a number of partners that they're trying to woo. And I read this lovely story about, um, you know, it's about a 1,000 strands per nest and they could build up to 15 nests in one season before they have a female go, yeah, I like what you've done there. I'm ready. Wow. I'm ready for food. So I, I, it gives me courage <laughs> when I don't get it right the first time. Or, yeah. Amazing, amazing. We have, um, what have we got? We've got a question here, which I was going to ask as well. Yes. So, Rachel, great question. How does Zora source her materials? And I'd also like to add to that and ask, what are some of your favourite materials to work yeah, with? Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, you know, it can be quite complex because I'm looking at a nest that was made in Scotland or one of my favourite nests was this one called a, um, a hoary red pole, which looks up in the Arctic. And so I'm looking for a fibre um, that will emulate, you know, something from the Arctic tundra. Um, but like a bird, I source everything locally um, and I couldn't believe it. Uh, my squash vines, I was a bit behind in my gardening and they had dried on the trellis. And I looked at them and I went, they look windswept and weathered and they were perfect for my hoary red pole nest. So I often, um, you know, people always say, how long does it take you to make a nest sculpture? And... Um, that's a really hard question to answer because I'm always sourcing materials and sometimes I don't even know that I've sourced a material for a nest that I'll make a year down the track. Um, but, yeah, everything is uh, sourced uh, sustainably, uh, locally. Um, but um, And sometimes, you know, I just put it out there to the universe and I say, oh, really use some emu feathers. And then discovered yeah. someone at work, her son actually worked at an emu farm, and another girl that I belong to a, um, an art group with, she said, oh, she says, I've got some emu feathers. Would you like them? I'm like, would I? Because <laughs> I don't have any emus running through the yard. So, um, but, yeah, so everything, um, I, I try not to purchase anything. I really don't want to add to that burden of waste. Um, and I want the sculptures to uh, naturally degrade. So that's another question. People say, how long does a sculpture last? Well, I've got a specimen uh, that I worked from that's in um, the Natural History Museum of London in Tring, and that specimen was collected here in Australia in 1838, and so it still exists. So if you look after your nest sculpture, it will last a long time. But they are natural materials, so they do degrade, and I like that because I, I feel like I don't want, you know, what's... Um, it's served its purpose of beauty and telling its story. It's okay that it would, you know, return to the earth. So, 
Yeah. And uh, we had a second part of that question. You said, what are my things that I wear? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we were talking before about um, horse hair. So uh, yeah. horse hair is one of the big things that I um, stitch with, um, as well as this plant called, I'm sure I'm not saying it right, so apology to the botanist, um, Fucrea fetida. And it's um, a relative of the sizal plant you know we have sizal carpets and whatnot but it's um, very malleable when you put it in water it's hard as a rock now obviously it's got all these you actually get really really long strong almost invisible strings so instead of using fishing line except for when i want to make a fishing line there's i'll always use natural so i don't use you know man-made yeah. threads um unless of course that's what the birds use so yes that's um yeah, so I'm lucky to have a few of these plants in my garden. And so um, part of the sizal family, isn't it? Part of yeah, the sizal. Yeah. Is. Yeah. So you dry them yourself and then you just you just strip the fibres out and then use them to weave with or stitch with. Well, I'm a little naughty and I let nature dry them. Um, ah, so I know you're supposed to. Well. <laughs> so yeah. some things I do dry, some things I do pick fresh and dry them. Um, but other things like, um, that one, they naturally sort of, you know, the bottom leaves dry. Yes. Um, and so I just collect them and use them how nature has um, left them for me. Yeah. yeah. Gorgeous. And I love this image here that you've yeah. taken with your horse hair, that strip yeah. of fibre there. And then your favourite needle. What's your favourite needle? Yeah, so I think it's, I think it's called a Chanel number no. 11. So it sounds like a perfume or Chanel. I'm not sure. <laughs> Yeah, so that's it there. And then I've also got the um, the felting needle as well. And a story I didn't get to tell when we were at the library, but um, mm. felting needles have ridges on them in the end. Mm. And it's those ridges on the end that do this repeated stabbing. Well, birds also have either ridges on their beak or something, or bristles. So essentially it's exactly the same thing. So they're stabbing something over and over again with that, that same ridge, which felts the fibres together. So, yeah. I loved that story that you told us at the library and it related to um, this beautiful one here, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. Just stunning. That was really quite special. Thank you so oh. much for sharing all that with us. And what about the Arium lilies behind you? We've got, yeah. um, <laughs> this is another thing that's quite common in Australian gardens. Um, yeah, and they are a weed species, so we do need to be careful with them. And I do love to weave with weed species. So if I can use a weed species, I will, um, just because I'm removing them from the environment and I can also tell that story um, of how we have to be careful uh, with introduced species into our Australian gardens. Um, but, yeah, plants in the wrong place, the poor things. Um, but, yeah, so I, I give them a new life and a nest sculpture and, and help the environment by removing them at the same time. Yeah, it's fantastic. I wanted to ask you, um, Laurie, if you're happy to share your beautiful eggs that you... Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a secret. That's a trade secret. <laughs> Is it a trade secret? We, we, we don't have no, to no. <laughs> tell people because they're here tonight. Um, so yeah, so people go, where do you get the eggs from? You know, and they're all different yeah. colours. Sometimes they're light blue, sometimes they're white. And they're actually pretty much all quail's eggs. It's very rare that I have to go out. And there's a wonderful little quail farmer uh, down the road in Seville in the Yarrow Valley. And um, especially when birds are first starting to lay eggs, they actually lay um, really small eggs um, or they can sometimes have different colours on the eggs. Um, so, yeah, you can see them. There's different colours and shapes. And they're, they're all quail's eggs. Um, and some of them are so tiny. Yeah, so those ones there... Um, a lot of people don't realize that uh, the color on an egg is deposited last. So if you take a light vinegar wash, you can actually rub the traditional brown spot off of the quail's egg and you're left with a white egg and then you can dye them with natural vegetable dyes. So I think those one were dyed with uh, purple cabbage and that's my hoary red pole nest. So uh, my Arctic tundra fiber there. Um, is actually from a squash plant <laughs> left in the oh, garden. Wow. Yeah, wow. and this is um, an extraordinary nest as well. So I blow them out with a syringe, and the great thing about that, it leaves these tiny holes which you can't see, but it means I can stitch them into the nest. So that particular nest that we're looking at there, that's uh, palm swift, and that's how the nest is. It actually hangs sideways in the wild, 
Um, and the bird would actually use glue um, of its own saliva to adhere the eggs sideways. And so I use horsehair and I just carefully thread them through those syringe holes that I've blown um, in the eggs. And that allows me to stitch them into the nest. So no spit required. <laughs> 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 Definitely. No, uh, that, that's fair enough in, in that sense. Tell me, yeah. what's the story between Nico and oh, the, the Lama? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is uh, Nicaragua, or otherwise known as Nico. So I have four llamas on the property and also two little ponies. And um, I often find nests that have either got horsehair in them or llama wool. And so I know the birds uh, utilize the beautiful wool and hair from my um, little flock that I have here. And so a lot of my nests will feature um, uh, wool in them uh, uh, as they would be out in the wild. And it's great. I've got sort of a selection. I've got um, um, one llama that's got quite beautiful grayish black hair and, and Nico's got that lovely sort of soft brown. So I've got this, you know, so I can just go outside and give them a bit of a brush and <laughs> <laughs> and um, use them in my nest. Our gorgeous Vicky Miller says, I've got some wombat hairs if you want one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. There's actually um, there's certain protocols about natural um, mm. native species. So um, you have to have permits to actually create um, with native animal uh, furs or feathers. Um, so you yeah. do have to be, especially if you plan to sell them. Um, so there's some for, um, so when you go to the um, library, you'll see two nests that have been made with fur. One of them is fox fur, so that's absolutely fine. I've got a friend who um, helps people who are losing chickens to foxes, and so I've sourced my fox hair from him. And the other nest uh, is modeled after a nest that is the Werribee Open Range Zoo from a New Holland honey eater. And I imagine that could be like gorilla or who knows what's in there. I use guinea pig. So thank you to uh, my friend Karen in Canberra. She sent me this extraordinary black and white fur from uh, one of her guinea pigs. And um, that's my gorilla fur. <laughs> oh, I love it. You know what? That's the best thing I love about the art community is that we're so willing to share not only information mm -hmm. but resources as well with each yeah. other. And you just have to ask or put it out there to the universe as you've yeah. demonstrated a number of times tonight that what be yeah. careful what you ask for. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Neela has said uh, there was a drought in Canberra and she accidentally left the hose on overnight mm. and by the morning the mud was very precious in a drought. Yeah, and discovered a family of white-winged. Now, how do I say this? Of course. Oh, chuff, I think it is. Yeah, chuff. Yeah. Chuff. Yeah. So I continue to help um, them get enough mud to build their nests. Oh, you did. Yeah. You collaborated. Yeah. And it's one of the things that I, um, if I take this particular exhibition touring, there is, like I said, I'd love mm. to remake that yellow warbler's nest from Galapagos. But I'd also love to um, include an example of a nest that's been made with mud because there's quite a few species that do and they make extraordinary structures. It was just, um, yeah, I, um, I did 27 for this particular exhibit, but that was on my list. I thought, oh, I would have loved to have made one because they, they do. They they have these wonderful clay bowl nests. <laughs> and that's another example of how birds, um, you know, are artisans and craftsmen. Yeah, wonderful. And for anyone in the Norvis, Northern Rivers, uh, Deb says that the pandan dan pandanus palm leaves um, mm. make that gorgeous horsehair. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and I just, um, just because I've got a lot of this particular um, sizal like plant, this Fukuya feta, and it's grow, it's enormous plant. Um, uh, so because I've got a lot of it, that's what I use. But yes, I've, um, I understand palm is is terrific for that as well. Yeah. Too. And the reason I use the horsehair um, is because I find so many nests that have horsehair in it here at the property, um, and a lot of historic specimens use horsehair. So that's my that's my reasoning behind it. Yeah. I wanted to remind people that, I'm just going to pop another link up here, that, that you've created a gorgeous catalogue to this mm -hmm. exhibition that people can follow this link that I've just popped up. It goes straight to um, Zora Verona website. You actually have a look at a book book and it, and it has the image of the nest and a description as well. So if you'd like to do, get a little, delve a little bit deeper with um, Zora Verona's beautiful nest, 
things mm. and look at that. Um, there's so many amazing stories. Um, that I think the stories behind the nests are just as extraordinary as the nests themselves. So I hope they really enjoy the catalogue and delving in. And when it's a book, I'll let you know. <laughs> but at the moment, it's, it's a flip book. <laughs> That's fine. That's absolutely fine. And one other, a couple of other questions before we wrap yeah. up, Laurie. Um, for me, I don't know as, as I'm getting older, but do you think there's a moment in time or is it an, a specific age? And I don't know if anyone else has felt this, but I mean, birds sort of, to me, felt quite insignificant for a long time. I never really noticed them. A bit like Banksia, I never really noticed them either until I met Tara Axford. But and it just changes your love affair with things. Like all of a sudden you sort of hit this certain age and you're like, oh, my goodness, what sort of bird's that? Or what's that yeah. bird sound? Or do you think yeah. it's something that just happens with a little bit of maturity? Or um, Well, look, I think COVID uh, brought a lot of people back to bird life um yeah for me i just nature always resonated with me and i remember i had this beautiful aunt her nickname was cookie so aunt cookie that's my mum's sister and yeah. i thought she was like a magician she could go hiking in the forest and she knew the names of all the plant species yes. and that just you know i was enthralled by that as a child and we had a big veggie garden as children and my aunt over in Slovenia grew grapes and she had um, peaches. And so I was always very connected to nature and it was always a place of restoration um, for me. Um, so, yeah, so I, I've just sort of naturally been moving towards that part of my life for, um, for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Vicky says, yeah, she, she definitely started to improve after. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly. Well, and I think in the weaving course that you take, like I loved reading the comments on Harriet's course, you know, when people first started and I'd sort of already gone through that journey with Ruth, but you start looking around and everything's a basket. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. you start looking at every plant differently, um, you know. Yeah. Yeah, so I think, um, yeah, you, your eyes do get open to it. Like I said, I was very fortunate to work inside the National Herbarium um, in Melbourne. So if people jog around the tan, they'll know that beautiful building. Yeah. And there is the most incredible plant specimens in there um, with stories attached. And so, yeah, that just further deepened my love of every plant and every species has a story to tell us. It's beautiful. And people have their own, you know, stories as well, their own connections. It's different for everyone, isn't it? Mad about bird life as a child. And then you've come back to it as you get older. Yeah, definitely. And then, you know, Rebecca was ill and yeah. she noticed a new type of awareness. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And that was the thing, like, during um, that bushfires in 2020, I didn't realise how much that would affect me. Um, but, you know, all the anxiety from 2009 just came flooding back in and I thought I really needed that, even though I lived out in the Euro Valley, I needed that reconnection and I needed, um, you know, that creative. So I would recommend, uh, you know, um, everyone, it, no matter where you take it, you know, even if it's just for your personal um, use, for want of a better term, but it's so uh, restorative. So, yeah, you yes. know, Highly recommend That's a beautiful word. Yeah. And there's so many beautiful quotes around the bird, you oh, know, about right. bird life and nests. And I wanted to mm -hmm. share one here, which was birds will give you a window if you allow mm -hmm. them. They will show you secrets from another world, fresh vision that though it is avian can accompany you home and um mm -hmm. and alter That's your true. life. Yeah. And that yeah. came from a book, Rare Encounters oh, with hey. Birds. I love um, that one. Yeah, I know. I've, I've suddenly got this burgeoning bird book collection. It's getting a little out of hand. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. And our weaving uh, books are getting a bit out of hand, and our art books and our online courses as well. It's um, it's so amazing that we've got so much knowledge at our fingertips. And mm. Lauren, your knowledge is just so deep and and wide. And I can't believe you remember all those amazing words and the people that you collaborate with. I'm just in awe. You're amazing. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. And I would love to. I am no ornithologist and I'm no botanist. And so, but I am, um, I'm really looking forward to, I've signed up um, online to the Cornell Labs um, uh, bird course or ornithology course. So I'm really looking forward to delving into Harriet's course and finishing it because I started it and then I got this exhibition um, 
uh, opportunity and so I had to put it aside so once the exhibition's finished I'm really looking forward to finishing Harriet's course and also continuing my learning I think the more you know something about a subject matter the more you realize there's so much more to learn so oh. a lot of people ask me they go oh you sure you just want to do bird's nest and I'm like there is 10,000 species of birds so I feel as though I, I will never really run out of um, that sense of discovery um, and also there's many other animals that make nests as well so even our insect life makes nests so yeah I think I'm, I'm firmly on the nest trail <laughs> I love it. Yeah, stick your path, stick to your path. Yeah. I tell you, it's just amazing. And I just love picturing you at your kitchen table and sort of surrounded by your little nest in your gorgeous home and um, creating and, and sharing that message. It's amazing. Yeah. And another thing to mention before we um, wrap it up, Laurie, is that it's um, Aussie Bird Week. Uh, yeah. And so at National Bird Week. And so we've got the Aussie Bird Count coming up. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's really, it takes so little time. So you register on the Aussie Bird Count uh, website. It's part of Bird Life Australia. And you just watch birds, I think it's for 20 minutes, one day within this week in your garden. And you send back um, the information of whatever birds you've seen uh, during that 20 minutes. But it is so helpful for them to build a picture of how our bird life is doing. So yes, I'd encourage everyone to uh, to sign up. And it's fun as well too. And it's uh, it's like a meditative process. Take 20 minutes out and spend it, you know, in a beautiful spot and just observe the birds that you see. That's gorgeous. And I'm sure there's things like that happening nationally as well. So mm -hmm. have a Google everyone and, and see what's happening in your area and just spend 20 minutes looking at birds. I think you'll love it. So we are going to play an exit slideshow um, for for you. And just if everyone can just pop a comment of thanks to, to Laurie oh. and to, for her sharing her time and expertise with us tonight. It's just been an absolute pleasure for our first live interview back for, you know, this this end season is um, was just such an honour. So thank you so much. Oh, and thank, thank you to you and Barbara Architect too, and for everyone here tonight and everyone who watches. It's it's been a real pleasure to share it with you. So thank you for having me. Anytime, anytime at all. We'll see you soon. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.